We go through life propelled by our desires. And sometimes we get what we want, and we're satisfied for a while, and then we're not, because so we have more desires. And we take it for granted that that's simply the way things have to be. And some of us think that, well, maybe if you get a lot of, lot of, lot of things, then the make up for one another's lack. Some people amass things, amass power, amass wealth, thinking that, well, a little wealth didn't satisfy, but maybe a lot of wealth will. Or a few things didn't satisfy, maybe a lot will. Or one partner didn't satisfy, so maybe a lot of partners will. But that wasn't the Buddha's approach. He wanted to find something that left no need for further desire. But then he also discovered that he really had to desire it to find it. There's a passage where, after he gained his awakening, he, he said, all things are rooted in desire. Things, the word here is dhammas, and that can mean good and bad things. Everything you experience, he said, is rooted in desire someplace. Because after all, the fact that you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking about things, you're not simply a, a passive recipient. You're out there looking for things to sense, looking for pleasures, looking for some satisfaction. That active side is rooted in desire. But then Nibbana, he said, is the ending of all dhammas. It's the one thing that is not rooted in desire. But to get there requires desire. This is why desire is one of the bases for success. The image that Ananda gives is of going to a park. To get there, you first have to have the desire to go, see that it's worthwhile. But then when you get to the park, the desire is gone. Now imagine a park that would be so totally satisfactory you wouldn't desire anything else in life. That would be nirvana. But it seems so far away and so improbable. And the path seems so hard. We find ourselves saying, well, maybe I'll put up with X or put up with Y. That'll be good enough for me. And this way we sell ourselves short. We have this potential to find something that puts us beyond the need for desire. And yet we go around looking for other things. The Buddha called those other things an ignoble search. The search for what Estathle said is the noble search. So you have to ask yourself, how much do you want it? And this is where motivation comes in. We talk about heedfulness as a kind of motivation. Or one who is, sees danger and respects being heedful, and that is in that chat just now. That seeing danger is one of those fancy etymologies that come from the commentary. They take the word bhikkhu and they take it apart into two syllables. And they decide it means one who sees danger. But it is appropriate, and these are called educational etymologies. In other words, just trying to get a meaning out of it. Whether it's historically true or not, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. But when you hear that word, you want to think, someone who sees danger. Because that's precisely what the Buddha was, someone who saw danger. He had all kinds of wealth all kinds of sensual pleasures, the potential for all kinds of power. But you saw danger in all these things. You get used to them, and then you're going to lose them. And when you lose them, what happens then? You fall. So seeing the danger in that, he said, I've got to find something else. So when you look at your own desires of what you want in life, ask yourself, do you see danger in what you desire? This evening I was reading a passage by John Cha, 
we said when he ordained. First, as a novice, he didn't see any danger around. He didn't really understand what ordaining was all about. But then as he became a monk and started studying, he began to realize there's danger in all kinds of things, especially the things that are really attractive. He said it was like seeing the, the best kind of banana they have in Thailand, Gloi Nam But realized that there was poison in it. And no matter how much you like that particular kind of banana, knowing that there's poison there, you avoid it. So when you find yourself wanting something that's going to let you down, remind yourself of the poison. Or you find yourself indulging in some sort of addictive behavior, whether it's substance abuse or emotion abuse. In other words, you let yourself stew in emotions that are really not productive, but you get some sort of satisfaction out of them. Self-pity, resentment. whatever it may be. Look for the poison. And then remind yourself, okay, it is possible to get past this. It is possible to get the mind in a state where it doesn't like this anymore and doesn't need this anymore. And try to cultivate a desire for that, that safe place. As the Buddha says, seeing renunciation is rest. Seeing that by letting go a lot of the things that you've been thirsting for and craving for, there's a greater sense of well-being. And this doesn't mean, of course, that you give up all desires. You have to desire that state of well-being, and then you have to approach it wisely. How do you get there? Focus on the causes and see the path as something that is doable. You might tell yourself, I can't manage this path. I won't be able to get to the end. But think about this. When you develop the path, you're going to change as a person. And the path will make you someone who is capable of reaching that goal. So try to put that in your mental calculation, the part of the mind that asks, this particular course of action, is it worthwhile or not? It may require a lot of effort, but if it repays really well, maybe it's worth doing. And if you tell yourself, I don't have the energy to put all that effort in, that's one of the reasons we practice a path, is it gives you more energy as you develop it. So do your best to remind yourself that this is a really real worthwhile goal something that lies beyond anything in our culture. Because that's the other big problem, is that there's so much in our culture. We live in a land of a world, wrong view that tells us that this kind of path is not worth it, it's not really real. People who follow this are losers or deluded. And the media are so pressing these days. People pair, carry a little bit of the media around in their pockets subject themselves to it constantly. And as John Fung used to say, they're just, people in general are disturbed by people who are more heedful than they are. They don't want to be told that there are dangers there. So they're going to try to dismiss you. So you have to ask yourself, am I going to allow myself to be blinded by their blindness? You have to wish them well, but you have to say, I have to resist that particular influence. And it's not just a matter of living in a country that hasn't been shaped by Buddhism. You go over to Asia, the country is shaped by Buddhism. People who practice have a hard time getting their families, getting their friends to see that it's a good thing. They have a little bit of practice, again, this is the middle way of the defilement. Say, well, do it a little bit, but don't take it too seriously. So the practice is always going to be countercultural. This is why, as John Munn said, you have to replace the culture you were raised in with the culture of the noble ones. This is what everybody in the practice has to do. So 
adopt new values, to adopt a new vision of what is possible in life. And so thinking in these terms that the desire to follow the path gets you on the right track. Because after all, the path, like everything else, is rooted in desire. You have to keep nurturing that desire. And although we have Dharma talks and books and everything to help you, you're the one who has to read them and apply them and say, this really does apply to me, and I really do want it. Think of the Buddha. He wanted this really strongly. He, was, he wanted it so strongly he was willing to try anything, even six years of self-torture. Fortunately, we don't have to follow that particular path. But you're not going to get rid of the need of desire just by telling yourself, well, I'm just going to stop desiring. You have to focus your desire in the right place, focus on the causes that lead to the result, and focus on the causes that will lead to a result that really is satisfactory. The end of desire is not simply a decision to stop desiring or to get, give up or be apathetic. The end of desire is reaching something that is so totally satisfactory that you don't need anything else. That's the success to which these bases of success are aimed.